Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Who told somebody about Jesus this week? Several people. Excellent, excellent. All right, did you try? Okay. All right, who's on time reading your Bible through this year, this, or at least this week? Okay, way to go, way to go. In our reading this week, uh, we, uh, we came across this statement. Uh, so who said this? But as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and he will stand upon the earth at last and after my body is decayed, yet in my body I will see God. I will see him for myself, yes. I will see him with my own eyes. I am overwhelmed at the thought. Who said that? Job. Job. <clears throat> he could see it by faith. His Redeemer standing on the earth. And he said, I'll see it in my body. And we all know that Job died at some point. But how is it that he's going to see his Redeemer in his body? At, huh? We all will. Well, in our resurrected bodies. Absolutely. Good, good. Um, now, here's a question I ask you every year. I hope you know the answer to it. We've been doing this about 10 years, I think. Who's the shortest man mentioned in the Bible? <laughs> huh? No. Bildad the shoe height, <laughs> not to be confused with Nehemiah. Okay, all right. Put him. <laughs> no, Zacchaeus was taller than both of those. But all right, he was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Yeah, I'll have to stop. It is vacation Bible school. You know, I'm tempted to go on with that, but no. Uh, then in the New Testament, when Paul was in Lystra, he was stoned and dragged out of town and left for dead. They thought he was dead. Uh, he wasn't dead, and when he came to, he got up, and what was the first thing he did? Went back to he went back in the city. The craziest thing. They just tried to kill you in the city, thought you were dead, and you get up and you go back into the city. Now that's courage. That's courage. Wow. Uh, we're in the book of 1 John, and our focus is in chapter 2, but uh, I wanted to stop for a moment and think about who is the guy that wrote 1 John? Hmm? Yeah, that's John, of course, but uh, who is this guy? Well, uh, Jesus, let me find my notes here, so I, I don't want to forget one of, these, one of these thoughts about him. Ah, here it is. Uh, John was one of Jesus' inner circle. When Jesus was mentoring the guys, he, he mentored all 12 of them, but there were three that, that he took specific interest in and were considered his inner circle. That was Peter, James, and John. Uh, and James and John were brothers. Jesus called them by a special name at one point. Sons of Thunder. Sons of Thunder. Uh, and uh, uh, so I don't know whether that was because they were volatile. Yeah. They were loud. Uh, or ambitious, or what it was, but uh, they were uh, they were his inner circle, and John was uh, a part of that. John was also considered a pillar of the early church. John was, uh, according to tradition, the only one of the apostles of the twelve that didn't die a violent death. Um, so. He uh, uh, lived a long time, and, and, and 
history tells us that he was the bishop of Ephesus at one point, uh, and Polycarp and others were mentored by him. Uh, I, I didn't give you the punchline last week of our lesson about Onesimus, because Onesimus was forgiven by Philemon, he went on to be the bishop of the church at Ephesus. So uh, a forgiven sinner can rise to great heights in ministry, no matter how bad their, their sin. Okay? Uh, John was a fisherman. He and his brother James worked with their father uh, in the fishing industry there on the lake of uh, uh, Tiberias or the Sea of Galilee as it's also known and uh, uh, you know he was uh, uh, at one point he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos because of his faith uh, he also wrote more of the New Testament than any of the other apostles he wrote five books. Can you name them? Revelation. Revelation is one of them. Okay, how about the Gospel of John? Okay, that's him. And then, to round it out, the, the little books, the, the epistles, the letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Uh, that's the guy. That's who... Uh, has written this text. And now, let's look at the purpose for what he wrote. And the purpose statements are found in uh, the first chapter of John, verse 4, where it says, And these things write I unto you, that your joy may be full. All right, let's look at your meter this morning. Let's do a little self-examination. On a scale of 1 or 0 to 10, what does your joy meter say about you this morning? Uh, where are you? Uh, you don't have to respond to that. That's a self-examination moment. These words were written that your joy might be full. This is not happiness. Happiness depends on your circumstances. If you were to come to me and say, Keith, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm in financial distress. I've made some terrible decisions. They just repossessed my car and I'm behind on my mortgage. Uh, you know, that's a pretty miserable place to be. And they'd fired me because I haven't been showing up on time at work. Well, you know, if I was to write you a check for $100,000 out of Terry's account. <laughs> You'd be dead. The last check he wrote, it was <laughs> And I gave you the check. You'd be really happy till you got to the bank. Then you'd be sad again. See, the circumstances surrounding us determine our level of happiness. What's the difference with, from that to joy? Hmm? Joy is more in our mind. It's, more in our state it's a state of being, yeah. It, it is our, 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 our thought patterns, our, our recognition that come what may, if the worst happens... It's not that bad because if we get our ticket punched, St. Peter calls us home, whatever euphemism you want to use, we get a promotion, right? And in the interim, we have the God of the universe residing in us. How's your joy this morning? So John writes this letter. To say that I've written this, that your joy might be full. Some of us are walking around and we think our joy meter's on empty. 
John says he wants it to be full in this letter. The Holy Spirit, through John, says he wants it to be full. The second reason we find in our text we're going to consider this morning in chapter 2, verse 1, where it says, uh, My little children, these things I write unto you, so he's telling us this is the reason I'm writing this, that you sin not. Don't let sin be a uh, pattern of your life. Now, he's not saying that we are expected to be absolutely perfect in our behavior. He's saying that as sinners saved by grace, we ought to sin less. And we ought to make it our mindset that we don't ever want to sin again, but we are going to stumble from time to time because why? Why are we going to stumble from time to time? Because we have this human body that inherited that nature of sin and our body wants the wrong thing instead of the right. And our appetites have been corrupted by the evil one. So we want, uh, what was it Charles Wesley said in one of his songs? He called it our bent toward sin. We have a natural leaning toward sin that's that's within us uh, so he wrote this that we might not sin that we that we understand and, and another way of saying it without corrupting the text is these things write I unto you not that you sin but that you may see your remedy for your sin that you might see your remedy for your sin uh, now, the third purpose, he writes, is in the fifth chapter, in verse 13, where it says, uh, and if you know that he hears us, whosoever or whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Uh, He's writing to us to, that we may know uh, our consolation with him, that we have confidence in him. Okay, all right, so joy, sin is not a pattern of life, and that we can know that we have eternal life. Um, and by the way, that wasn't verse 13, apparently. Um, it was three. Yes. No. No, it's not it's not five three. Okay. Well, I've lost the uh, uh, the actual address of that one. Two, three. Oh, it's two three. <coughs> not five three. Okay, two three. Um, and hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. We can know um, uh, our salvation. We don't have to wonder about it. Okay. Uh, but I don't want to pass by John chapter 1 or 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. That verse has been a lifesaver for me. Uh, when I was in my late teens struggling with my identity as a Christian Wondering if I really was a Christian, if God really had forgiven me, if, if I really was saved. I'd given my life to Christ at age 11, and I had uh, made it my uh, uh, desire to, to walk with him and walk for him. But because of my failures, my moral failures... I had a serious concern about whether my faith was real or not, whether I really was forgiven. What does 1 John 1, 9 say? Uh, it says, if we confess our sins, I had done that, he 
is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My part was to confess. I had done that. And I knew I had done that. I'd done it repeatedly over and over again. And I had done it currently. If I confessed my sins, then. By the way, that's a big if. Not everybody does. But I highly recommend it. Because if you confess your sins, then he takes over. He takes over. Uh, he is faithful. Do you believe God is faithful? Woo, my word. Uh, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That does not mean that we're cleaned up so much that we can't sin. It just means that as we stand before God, we're in the courtroom. St. Peter's called us home. We're standing in the dock, as it were, guilty before God. We know we've sinned. He knows we've sinned. Our attorney knows we've sinned. And the judge says, what do you have to say for yourself? <laughs> I'm standing before a righteous God. What can I say? What can I say? Then my attorney, Jesus, steps up. May I approach the bench? The judge says, yes, of course. He comes to the bench. The, the prosecuting attorney has been calling out all these horrible things that this man's done. I'm standing before the judge and my advocate, Jesus, approaches the bench and says, Dad, this one belongs to me. And he's guilty. You see, we know we're guilty. We've done horrible things. Jesus says, Dad, he's guilty. Now, you wouldn't have a defense attorney doing that for you here in a courtroom here. In a courtroom here, the defense attorney is going to say, I know everybody saw him do it, but he didn't do it. Okay? Everybody knows he's guilty, but he didn't do it. But no, not in that courtroom. In that courtroom, our defense attorney is going to say, Dad, you know he's guilty. I know he's guilty. He knows he's guilty. But I pray, I paid the price for those sins that he committed. I paid the price. Your wrath, your righteous judgment was poured out on me, and I paid the price for that sin. The judge picks up his gavel, wraps it on the desk. And says, guilty as charged. However, the penalty has been paid. You may go free. Wow. Wow. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we stand before God. If we are forgiven, if we're in Christ, we stand before God clean. He sees us through his son Jesus. All right. Uh, I guess we better get to the text. Uh, we're in 2 John, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, um, the atonement for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. 
My word, my little children. John's probably 80 years old when he's writing this. And some of us know that all young people seem to be children to us at our ages. So he's writing to his little children. Now some of these he may have birthed into the kingdom. He may have been their spiritual father, writing these things so that you may not sin. By the way, sin does not make you a sinner. Did you know that? Sin does not make you a sinner. <laughs> the psalmist David said, I was formed in iniquity in my mother's womb. There is a fly here. Mm -hmm. uh, and in sin did my mother conceive me. He knew sin is a natural state of a human being being born into this world. Every human being that's ever been born from a natural father had that carnal nature passed down to them. Thank you, Dad. That's where we got it. Now, how is it that Jesus didn't have a carnal nature? Who was his dad? Ah, his dad was holy and righteous. God himself was the father of Jesus. So he didn't have a carnal nature. But sinning doesn't make us a sinner. Sinning is the evidence that we are sinners. Because we were born this way. With a nature that craved to do the wrong thing rather than the right. So it's the fact that you sin does not make you a sinner. We're just born that way. And the rest of us, uh, those of us who know Jesus, uh, we have become saved sinners. Because we still have that nature in us that wants to do the wrong thing. Um, but, he says, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is our defense attorney. But don't expect your defense attorney to say you're innocent or you're, you're, you didn't do it. Your defense attorney is going to say, yes, you did do it. But you've been forgiven. And someone paid the price for that sin that you committed. I did. Okay, that's our advocate. Uh, Hebrews chapter 7, if you want to turn there, uh, just to the left of where you are now. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, uh, one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. This one and 1 John 1, 9. Uh, such comfort we draw from these. Uh, chapter 7, verse 25 says, Wherefore he is able, and he is Jesus, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them. Our defense attorney's on the job right now, sitting at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and for me. He's there. He's at work. That's what he's been doing for the last 2,000 years. He's been interceding for us. What a comfort. He's on the job. He's always on the job. Defending us before the Father. Um, so we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation or the atonement for our sins. He paid the price for our sins. And not ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Potentially for the whole world. Everybody that would ever ask God to forgive them, he paid the price for those sins. Now, uh, we have a fill-in on page 76 of your study guide. Uh, because of God's righteousness and holiness, humanity's sins must be atoned for in order for people to be reconciled to God. As the propitiation, the atonement for sins, Christ's death is the appeasement or satisfaction of God's wrath against sin. So holiness, reconciled, and death are your fill-ins. Okay, 
Point number two, obeying Jesus comes from knowing him. And let's read uh, the second section of text, beginning in verse three of chapter two. Uh, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Uh, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. One of the struggles I had was this verse with my identity in Christ. It says, for we know that uh, we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Which ones? 613 given by Moses. By the way, a point of trivia, you take 100 pomegranates, you count the seeds in each one, it's going to average 613 seeds in a pomegranate. I know, no extra charge for that. Okay. Uh, but which ones, which, which rules, which commandments is he talking about here? <clears throat> How many? Just two. Just two. Jesus pointed us back to uh, uh, Deuteronomy. And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's the greatest commandment. And the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, so we, we don't have to keep the 613 that Moses gave. We only have to keep the two. And if you get the first one right, the second one comes naturally, okay? If you get the first one right, the second one comes naturally. And we, we know that we've come to know him if we keep his commandments. If it's the desire of your heart to love the Father, to love God with everything that's in you, and then out of that will come loving your neighbor as yourself. Then, you know that you've come to know him. And whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments or doesn't love God and their neighbor is a liar and the truth is not in him. There's some folks in the church like that. They don't know him, or at least they don't know him like they ought to. Um, then the last section I want to hurry because I've got, a, I've got an illustration I want to share with you. Obeying Jesus comes from loving him. Verse 5, but whoever keeps his word in him truly, the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So we have an example. We have an example of how we are to live and his name is Jesus. We don't live like somebody else. We shouldn't put our eyes on another person as far as our example. And there's some good ones out there. There are some good ones. But the only one worthy of our uh, attention and loyalty is Jesus, that we ought to be uh, walking the same way which he walked. All of this is possible because Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood for us um, for the cleansing of sin. So I want to share this as I wrap up this uh, story that is related by Charles Finney. Charles Finney was a, a, a fabulous evangelist of yesteryear, and he was conducting, or I'll read it in his words, I was conducting a revival in Detroit. <clears throat> One night as I started to walk into the church, a man came up to me and said, are you Mr. Finney? And he said, yes. I wonder if you would do me a favor. When you get through tonight, can we talk? Uh, will you come and talk to me about my soul? Gladly, he said, you wait for me. Uh, I walked inside and some of the men stopped me. And they asked me, what did that man want, uh, Brother Finney? He, he wanted me to go with him and talk to him about his soul after the service is over. And they said, don't. I'm sorry, he said, but I promised and I will go with him. When the service was over, the man and I walked three blocks 
down the street into a side street, down an alley, and then stopped. He unlocked the door and said to me, come in. I walked into the room and the man locked the door behind us and reached into his pocket and pulled out a revolver. And he held it in his hand. He said, I don't intend to do you any harm. He said, I just want to ask you a few questions. Did you mean what you said in your sermon last night? <clears throat> well, what did I say? I've forgotten. You said, the man continued, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Then he said, yes, God says that. Uh, the man said, Brother Finney, <clears throat> you see this gun? It's killed four people. Uh, it's my gun. <clears throat> Two of them were killed by me and others were killed in my bar at my direction. Is there any hope for a man like me? I said, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. The man replied, in the back of this uh, 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 wall is my bar. I own it and everything in it, and we sell every kind of liquor to anybody who comes along. Many, many times I've taken the last dollar out of a man's pocket, letting his family go hungry. Several times mothers with their kids dressed in rags have come in and begged me not to sell booze to their husband. But I threw him out and continued selling liquor until the man's money was gone and then I threw him out. Is there any hope for a man like me? And then Finney says, God says, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Another question, Brother Finney. In the back of this other wall is a gambling establishment, and it's as crooked as sin and Satan. There isn't a decent wheel in the whole place. It's all loaded and crooked. A man may leave the bar with some money left, but we get it from him in there. Men have gone out of there to commit suicide with their, uh, when their money and perhaps trusted funds from somebody else were all gone. Is there any hope for a man like me? Finney says, God says the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. One more question and I'll let you go. When you walk out of this alley, you'll... Turn to the right, you'll see a brownstone house. That's my house. I own it. My wife is there and our 11-year-old daughter, Margaret. Thirteen years ago, I went to New York on business, and I met a beautiful girl. Uh, I lied to her, and I told her I was a stockbroker, and she married me. I brought her here, and when she found out what my business really was, it broke her heart. I've come home drunk, beaten her, abused her, locked her out of the house, made her life more miserable than that of any brute beast. About a month ago, I went home drunk, mean, miserable. My wife got in my way somehow, and I started beating her. My daughter threw herself between us. I slapped her across the face and knocked her into a red-hot stove, and her arm is burned from the shoulder to the wrist. And it'll never look the same again. Brother Finney... Is there any hope for a man like me? I took hold of the man's shoulder and shook him. Oh, son, what a black story you have to tell. But God says the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The man said, thank you. Thank you very much. Pray for me. I'm coming to church tomorrow night. I went, about, I went about my business, and the next morning about 7 o'clock, the guy started across the street out of his office. His necktie was a rise face, was dusty and sweaty and tear-stained. 
He was shaking and rocking as if he were drunk, but let's go back to that room. He had taken his swivel chair and smashed the mirror, the fireplace, the desk, and all the other chairs. He had smashed the partition on each side. Every bottle and barrel in the bar, the mirrors in the saloon were shattered and broken. The sawdust was swimming ankle deep in a terrible mixture of beer, gin, wine, and whiskey. In the gambling establishment, the tables were smashed. The dice and the cards were in the fireplace, smoldering. He staggered across the street, walked up the stairs of his home, and sat down heavily in his chair in his room. His wife called their daughter and said, Maggie, run upstairs and tell your father that breakfast is ready. The girl walked slowly up the stairs, half afraid. She stood in the door and said, Daddy, breakfast is ready. Mama says to come down. <clears throat> Maggie, dear, your father doesn't want any breakfast. Maggie ran down the stairs and said, Mommy, Daddy said, Maggie, dear. And he didn't come down. Maggie, you don't understand. You didn't hear what you thought you heard. Go back upstairs and ask him to come down for breakfast. Maggie went back upstairs with her mother following her. The man looked up as he heard his daughter's footstep and encouraged her to his knee and said, Maggie, come here. Shyly, frightened and trembling, the young girl walked up to him. He placed her on his lap, pressing his face against her, weeping. His wife, standing in the doorway, couldn't understand what was happening. After a while, he noticed her and said, come here, dear. And he threw his arms around them both, the ones he had so fearfully abused. Lowering his face between them, he sobbed until the room almost shook with the impact of his emotion. After some moments, he controlled himself and looked up into their faces and said, you needn't be afraid of me anymore. Last night, I learned something that changed my life. God has made a new man out of me. A new husband and father came home today. And that night, the three of them went to church and walked down the aisle giving themselves to Christ. <clears throat> the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. That's not me saying it. That's not Finney saying it. That's the Holy Spirit through the Word of God saying that. And we can depend on that. And we can rest in that. Where's your joy meter this morning? You at zero or ten or somewhere in between? Examine what's going on. Diagnose it and get it right. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together in your Word. We are so grateful for, uh, for the Word, for your Scripture that encourages us and satisfies us and confirms us and encourages us. Now, Lord, we pray that you would help us to be what we ought to be, to walk as we ought to walk, to love as we ought to love. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. If anybody wants to...